Senator Johnson, face the nation. You're about to see the Democratic vice presidential candidate, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas, face the nation in a spontaneous and unrehearsed interview with veteran correspondents from the nation's press. Peter Lissagor, chief of the National Bureau of the Chicago Daily News, and William S. White, nationally syndicated columnist. And now, here's the moderator of Face the Nation, CBS News correspondent, Stuart Novin. Senator Lyndon Johnson, of course, is not only the Democratic nominee for the vice presidency of the United States, he's also running for re-election to the Senate from his home state of Texas. During the last few days, he's been campaigning in the South, and he's planned an even deeper trip into the South for next week. He is generally felt to be, to have been uh, put on the ticket because of his relationship with some of the Southern states. And he's here now to face the nation. Senator Johnson, if this election were held tomorrow, how many of the Southern electoral votes would you have, and where would they come from? Have you any idea now? No, I don't, uh, I don't think one can accurately forecast uh, uh, what we'd have tomorrow, but uh, I think we're in better shape in the South than the Democratic Party has been in uh, since the third term in 1940. I do not know of one single elected Southern leader who has defected. We have had some uh, ex-governors and uh, uh, ex-office holders uh, who have uh, gone over to the Republican uh, camp, but in Texas, our governor, our attorney general, all the members of Congress, and that's pretty true all through the South. I think with the exception of the governor of Mississippi, who even uh, refuses to vote for the Republican ticket, we have every single Southern governor supporting uh, our ticket. Uh, I have not uh, made the trip through the South as yet, and I'll know more about it after I do. Uh, I was interested in your comment about uh, my Southern travels. I did uh, make a speech in Knoxville uh, the other night in Jackson, yes. uh, but most of my time has been spent uh, in states uh, like Nebraska and Missouri and uh, uh, those other states, and I'll go to the South a little later on. Well, Senator, uh, when you talk about having the organized or having the support of the elected officials, uh, there is a qualification, isn't there, in that some of those officials have said they'll support the ticket but not the party platform. Oh, yes, I think that uh, there's no platform that's ever completely satisfactory to every person. Uh, I'm sure there's some planks to the Democratic platform that the people of Massachusetts don't like, and there's some in there that the people of uh, uh, Texas don't like. Uh, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, even uh, Vice President Nixon is not completely happy with the platform, at least as rewritten by Governor Rockefeller that night up in the Waldorf Towers. You have to understand that uh, 100 people out of 180 million participate in writing a platform, and it is an expression of hope, and uh, it's not, it's like a bill. Uh, no bill is completely satisfactory to every person. Uh, I would change the I across the T in a lot of bills that we pass. I'm sure the president would do likewise, but the question is, on balance, is it good? And if it's good enough to embrace, uh, do you support it? And we we have worked out a platform that we think is a, a good platform, and I stand on that platform. I think that's the uh, vice president's uh, feeling, too. He had the uh, uh, platform all written, but uh, Mr. Rockefeller turned him around and changed it, and uh, uh, I noticed that uh, he and uh, Mr. Goldwater accepted those changes uh, somewhat reluctantly, but uh, uh, they, they accepted them. Mr. Liscard? Uh, Senator Johnson, it seems that they've done more than not accept the platform. In the case of the governor of Texas, for example, he has openly repudiated the platform, as I understand some of the other southern leaders have done. Now, how, how do you plan to counter this in the South? By carrying the state, which we're going to do. You, you're pledged to stand on the platform as is. Yes, I'm, I'm running on the platform as is, and uh, uh, there are good many uh, governors that have objections to provisions of it, although, as I recall, they offered a resolution in the Resolutions Committee uh, that should interest you people to condemn the platform, and it got two votes, uh, 29 Senator. to 2. Uh, so I would say that the hope of the Republicans to carry the South is a... The, uh, the wish is father to the thought. I would think that uh, the Democrats have a much better chance of carrying uh, Mr. Lodge's Massachusetts or Mr. Nixon's California than the Republicans have of carrying a single southern state because the South has a long memory 
and the South can remember what they promised them eight years ago and four years ago and what they've got. Senator, I wonder if I could be a little more specific about the platform. In your own state, for example, there's now, which a which platform are you talking about? The Democratic platform. Uh, okay. uh, there's a strong feeling in Texas, for example, in support of right-to-work laws. The Democratic platform uh, uh, has promised to uh, repeal the authorization in the Taft-Hartley law for uh, right-to-work laws. Uh, how do you specifically stand on that? I stand upon the platform, and I will carry out the provisions of the platform. Mm -hmm. It will have to be implemented by an act of Congress. Uh, that provision, I might say, has been in every Democratic platform since 48. It was in the 48 platform, it was in the 52 platform, it was in the 56 platform. And I think we make it clear that that is in the, the 60 platform. Now, Vice President Nixon has been, as I understand his quotations, on all three sides of it. But I think we're pretty clear and definite. Now, I, I don't know the sentiment of the state. I haven't uh, taken any poll, uh, uh, but uh, my, my judgment is that we will uh, uh, carry the state of Texas by a rather substantial margin. And I'd like to ask you about one more specific in that platform, Senator, and that is the depletion allowance, the oil depletion allowance, in which the platform, the Democratic platform, promises to close the loopholes and specifically refers to that uh, that one uh, allowance. Do you that's a Republican approach to it, Mr. Lisco, and unless we object to you about this, the Democratic platform, uh, that's what, you, what you've said is what they say. Well, that's I have not, the that's language not, that's here not which correct I'll read all, to Because you. the Democratic platform doesn't mention uh, oil in any respect. And most people don't know that there are 105 depletion allowances. The Democratic platform that the convention adopted pledges itself to close loopholes, period. Now, in the little dicta, uh, it adds that such loopholes as extravagant expense accounts, dividend uh, uh, receipts, and uh, depletion allowances. Which are inequitable. Now, which are inequitable. Now, last year, every Democratic member of the House Ways and Means Committee voted on that question, and all of them voted uh, against reducing the depletion allowance on oil. Now, the vice president has little oil speech that he makes when he comes to Houston or Mr. Goldwater makes when he goes to Dallas on oil. And uh, they say now your platform here indicates that you're going to reduce the depletion allowance on oil. Now, of course, it doesn't. It doesn't say that at all. Uh, the, the person that's doing most to reduce the depletion allowance is Senator Williams, a Republican of Delaware, who would succeed to the chairmanship of the Finance Committee if uh, the Republicans should win the Senate. Uh, he would take Senator Byrd's place. Now, he offered an amendment almost each year to reduce it from 27.5% to 15. But he is overwhelmingly voted down two to one, and I think there would continue to be. And uh, I don't think there's uh, any more reason to conclude the Democratic platform's unfavorable on depletion allowance for public. As a matter of fact, the Republican platform says they favor a reasonable depletion allowance, and the one that would interpret it would have to be the Congress. And their leader in the Congress, Mr. Williams, says that he thinks 15% is reasonable. So I would assume that all the oil people ought to really be concerned about the position Mr. Williams takes. Question for Mr. White, please. Senator, to go back to, uh, away from the platform for a moment to the scoreboard, what you've said here seems to indicate that you have a fairly strong conviction that the Democrats will carry the entire South. Is this your prediction about it? I think that is true as of today. He asked me if I had to decide tomorrow. I don't see a single outstanding Southern leader that's been elected to a position of trust by his people who have embraced uh, uh, the Republican uh, Party or the Republican platform. Right. I've had some questions about the Democratic platform, but uh, so far as the Republican platform is concerned, there are many provisions in it that uh, uh, I'm sure the uh, leadership of the South uh, would not embrace. And while they can, uh, they d some of them do enjoy speeches by Senator Goldwater, uh, I do not think some of the provisions that uh, Senator uh, Governor Rockefeller recommend would be acceptable. Yes. Go, may I go from there to the Middle West, Senator, uh, preface the question with this inquiry. Uh, there's an impression among many of us, uh, I think, who watch politics, that the struggle in the Middle West on domestic issues, at least, or on basic issues, uh, so-called bread and butter issues, is between the Democratic attack on the Benson Farm Program on the one side, that seems to be the strong Democratic trust, and between Mr. Nixon's uh, uh, so-called peace issue or the issue standing up the truth job on the other side. Now, the question is, is, is this. 
in your opinion, is the is the supposed unpopularity of Mr. Benson being altogether blunted, or partly blunted, or only slightly blunted by the Nixon issue on the Khrushchev matter? I would say partly blunted. I, I would say that the Republicans uh, uh, have done a pretty j good job of hard selling in an attempt to make it appear that uh, Mr. Nixon can uh, best stand up to Mr. Khrushchev. Uh, I think that uh, where you hear the other side of it, uh, the argument uh, doesn't stand. It's not a question so much of one individual uh, standing up to Mr. Khrushchev. It's a question of the government and the country standing up to Mr. Khrushchev. Now, uh, if uh, Mr. Nixon's uh, uh, experience in the kitchen is uh, to be considered as a, a, a kind of a standing up we want to uh, have our country do to Mr. Khrushchev, uh, then I don't think the people want that kind of standing up. I think that Mr. Nixon has this handicap. All the people of the country understand we're going to have a democratic Congress. Now the question is, can Mr. Nixon and the Democratic Congress do more to stand up to Mr. Khrushchev than a Democratic president with a Democratic Congress. And uh, I think that when you explain that to them and you get away from the Washington image of the vice president and see just what decisions he's made in the seven years and seven months he's been in office, actually, uh, how has he stood up to people? He made a Latin American tour, that's true, and he took the Marines to help him get home safely. Then uh, uh, he's been to see the Queen, uh, that's true. He had an argument in the Moscow kitchen. But during that period of time, uh, uh, Senator Kennedy has had to vote on, I guess, eight or nine hundred uh, uh, matters affecting uh, our relations with other nations and foreign affairs. During that period, the Vice President's voted only seven times. Now, the question is, who can take the Democratic Senate and the Democratic House and unite them with the Executive Department and the Secretary of State and give us the best front toward the world? Who can lead us the best? And when you discuss that with the people of the Midwest and any other place, uh, uh, you blur this a little. Let me ask you another spe rather specific question on sort of in scoreboard terms again, Senator. Do you think now that the Democratic ticket will carry the farm belt? By that I mean principally the wheat, corn, hog states. No, I would not predict it would, although uh, I have not been in any state that I could with assurance uh, say this is a Republican state. I think a good deal. Have good. you been into Kansas, for example? Yes, yes, I've been into you Kansas. Kansas. They had one of the had one of the finest rallies that we have ever had there, and I've been in Kansas two or three times. But uh, uh, we have a good uh, Democratic candidate for the Senate out in Kansas, the form of our national commitment. We have terrific enthusiasm, and I think there's a, a deep feeling among all the farmers they can take eight more years of uh, uh, what they've got. And, uh, way of uh, agricultural program, and I think that's going to show itself. Senator Johnson, uh, one of the paramount issues today, I think you'll agree, is foreign policy. And President Eisenhower is right now under great pressure in the United Nations to meet with the Soviet Premier Khrushchev. I wonder if you could tell us how you feel about such a meeting. I think that's a matter up to the President. I would not want to uh, express an opinion that influence him or prejudice his conduct. He has all the information before him, and uh, I would uh, uh, be glad to go along with any decisions that he reached. He speaks for our country in the field of foreign relations. I think that uh, this is a pretty serious situation we have there. I think uh, the chips are down. I think our people got to realize the gravity of it. Uh, Mr. Khrushchev's not just doing a lot of clowning, in my opinion. Uh, I think that uh, we're in a very critical period, and the road ahead's a rather hazardous one. I don't want to contribute to making it more hazardous by uh, uh, any uh, complaints or uh, predictions, but uh, uh, I think that people have got to be told the facts. I don't agree with the administration at all, that, uh, or Mr. Nixon, that uh, uh, you shouldn't discuss the issues in this campaign. As a matter of fact, uh, I was... Uh, uh, rather amused at a letter I got yesterday. Uh, I was going to release the press tomorrow, uh, signed the Assistant Secretary of State, to, uh, which bears on whether we should discuss these uh, problems at all or not. And Mr. McComber says that uh, they gave consideration to postponing the meeting of the UN. 
in 60, just as they did postpone it in 56, and as they did in 52. And I presume that uh, they gave consideration as to whether that was in the national interest to postpone these discussions till after the election. But they resolved uh, that it was not necessary to postpone them. So if it's not necessary to postpone Mr. Kuchev's talks, Mr. Castro's talks, Mr. Tito's talks, or Mr. Eisenhower's talks, I don't know why Senator Kennedy should be silenced. And I want to read one important sentence from that uh, letter. The possibility of postponement was carefully considered early this summer by the department in consultation with Ambassador Lodge. Neither the department nor Ambassador Lodge saw any serious risk to United States interest in proceeding on schedule. Senator, well, Senator does, that, uh, does that letter ask you or Senator Kennedy not to discuss these issues of national security and foreign policy? No. Uh, how, how did you come by that letter? Was it an answer to a letter of yours? Yes, we, we wrote the State Department and asked them uh, if they had considered, uh, in the light of the statements made by the Vice President, that uh, we ought to postpone all this discussion, if they had considered uh, postponing the UN meeting uh, this year, as they did in 56 and as they did in 52, because the indications were that uh, they felt that any discussion of uh, issues would be bad. Uh, and it looks like they want to cover up these issues, and I think that's part of the Republican strategy. I think that they want to hide uh, uh, the failures uh, behind Mr. Khrushchev's talk. Well, Senator, Senator may, may I ask you, sir, you, <coughs> pardon me, you paint a, a, a pretty vivid picture, and you have this le letter now as evidence to support the theory that there's nothing wrong in criticizing the administration policies, and yet you walk out of it. Having done that, you, you decline to take any kind of position on, on these policies. You say this is the president's business. Well, Let I, me ask you a I question. Said, I said on this specific <laughs> point, uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to say that I oppose just for the sake of opposition. I no, I realize I'm more that. constructive than that. You just asked me uh, one question, and I told you that that was a matter that I would be uh, guided uh, by his opinion on. Well, let me ask you this question, sir. Uh, if you and Mr. Kennedy are elected, you'll be inheriting these problems in January. Well, Mr. Kennedy will, as the president of the country. Well, I'm the thinking vice in terms president of a, speak of a for ticket. this nation in connection with our relations with other nations. The vice president, under his constitutional function, presides over the Senate. Under what conditions would a democratic administration in January meet with the Russians? Well, you'll have to you'll have to ask Senator Kennedy that question when he's elected, and after he appoints his Secretary of State, what the circumstances of the moment happen to be. Senator but, Johnson, Senator, you, let me ask you this, if I may. Uh, a uh, fairly specific question again. I think the Republican campaign uh, policy is essentially, I think, one of suggesting that uh, Senator, uh, that Mr. Nixon and uh, Mr. Lodge are more experienced in foreign policy and more mature in their handling of it. How would you reply on behalf of the Democratic ticket to this specific issue, and it clearly is an issue, of which ticket is more experienced and which, uh, toward which ticket people could give greater trust and confidence. How would you reply yourself? I think that uh, they have made much of the argument of maturity and experience, and uh, I, I don't think that you can say that uh, they have all the edge or we have all the edge. I would like to present these facts uh, to have them evaluated. Uh, the Vice President and Senator Kennedy entered uh, Congress the same day. Uh, Senator Lodge served eight years in the Senate and has served eight years in the United Nations. Uh, I have served uh, in Washington for 30 years come next year, 24 years of which have been in the House and in the Senate. So I don't guess there's a great deal of weight one way or the other on uh, the number of years you've served. Then the question comes, what kind of decisions have you been making? During the last uh, seven years and seven months, the Vice President, so far as I'm aware, has voted seven times in the Senate and made seven decisions, and Senator Kennedy has probably voted 700 times. Are you speaking of foreign Senate. policy decisions? All kinds of decisions, domestic and foreign. Good many foreign policy decisions. Senator Kennedy sits there on the Foreign Relations Committee each day and has to act on the matters come before it. Now, as far as I know, the Vice President has not been making those decisions, has not been making recommendations. I've seen where he was going to uh, help get a school bill out of the House Rules Committee, and he's going to put his uh, influence behind some other domestic measures. But I haven't seen uh, where he really made any of those decisions. But I, I don't think there's a great deal of difference in all fairness. I think both uh, candidates have had uh, 
a good deal of experience, 14 years in the federal government, and the Lodge has had 16, and I have had 30. Uh, I wouldn't think that uh, a few goodwill trips and uh, self casting seven votes to break ties in the Senate that would be uh, overwhelming evidence of maturity or experience. Senator Johnson, the Vice President has made the point, however, that he and Mr. Lodge have participated in the discussions which has, has led to those great executive decisions in the foreign policy field. You've addressed yourself to the legislative decisions that uh, the Vice President may or may not have taken part in. On the basis of his participation in the executive decisions, how would you answer Mr. White's question? Well, I would say that in some of the discussions, that the leadership of the Senate, in the t 10 years that I have been in that type of work, some of those discussions the Vice President has been in on. I believe he has participated in one or two by uh, making an observation. I have never seen him uh, make uh, any strong recommendations one way or the other on them. Are you I know saying of no uh, important uh, decision in the field of uh, our relations with other nations or the defense of our country that the Congress uh, has not been uh, uh, aware of and has not been consulted and uh, uh, periodically before the President takes a trip or after he comes back from one or before he goes to a conference or after he comes back from one, he calls in the leadership. And in some of those meetings, the Vice President has been present. Some of them, uh, Ambassador Lodge has, but uh, I would say by no means all of them. Are you saying then that uh, you believe that the Republican claims for Mr. Nixon and his own claims for himself have been exaggerated? No, I think that uh, they have 14 and 16 years experience compared to my 30 and Senator Kennedy's 14. And I would say that the, the decisions of leadership so far as foreign policy is concerned are rest as heavily upon the leader of the majority of the Senate to during the last eight years as they have upon the Vice President who breaks the tie. Senator, uh, I think they rest as heavily on a member of the Foreign Relations Committee who must vote on all these measures as it does an ambassador who is making a speech in the United Nations. Now, I do not want to uh, run down their experience. They've had a good deal of experience in these posts, but uh, I would uh, respectfully submit that the position of leader of the Senate and the position of membership on Foreign Relations Committee for that period of time is one that ought to equally be considered. Senator, you spoke of the gravity of the times in the United Nations today. Uh, would you have a judgment on what conditions, if any, the President should lay down before he meets with Mr. Khrushchev? I think that's a matter that the President ought to determine. Now, five neutralist nations have uh, asked that this be done through a resolution in the UN. Uh, would you suggest that uh, he ought not to meet with I wouldn't the suggest to the President uh, what he ought to do or what he ought not to do. He has the information in this field. He has that responsibility. Uh, he is the one who will have to make the decision. I would not want to prejudice his action one way or the other. Well, let me ask you one final question on this point, Senator. Would you, uh, would you believe or judge that presidential politics or the campaign is a factor in this decision? I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, would you think in the, whose decision? in the President's decision whether to meet with Mr. Khrushchev or not to meet with him? I No, I, I would uh, credit the President with the best of motives. I have never seen the President to play politics with foreign policy. I have a great admiration for the President in that respect, and I, I think that that's something that the voters are going to bear in mind, too. Uh, we've had divided government for the last uh, six years. And we have done our best to bend over backwards and try to meet the president more than halfway. Now, there's no question what we're going to have a Democratic Congress. And I think it's very important that we not have stalemate government. And I rather doubt that during the administration of Mr. Nixon that uh, the, the executive and the legislative would work as harmoniously and as cooperatively uh, as they have under uh, Mr. Eisenhower, because Mr. Eisenhower has never been a deep <coughs> partisan. And uh, I think that he has tried to meet us halfway, too. Senator, if we could turn from uh, foreign policy to some domestic problems for a moment. Uh, your ticket has been talking in terms of quite an extended uh, program of social welfare legislation, school construction, teacher salaries, and so forth. Uh, do you anticipate that this means a, a rise in taxes, and what kind of a bill is involved here? No, uh, I, I do not anticipate that it means a rise in taxes. I would think that over a period of uh, before the first administration's out, it could mean a gradual reduction of taxes. 
our platform pledges a balanced budget to cases except a, a national emergency. Now, there, a lot of people say, well, how in the world do you do that and pass a school construction bill? Well, the uh, president's recommended school construction bill. Uh, uh, the only thing that kept us from passing one is the House Rules Committee. We couldn't get a single Republican vote on it. Now, the medical care bill. That's one of the most important bills that the Congress has ever been faced with. This year, we got uh, 44 votes. We only got one Republican vote. But uh, that was a pay-as-you-go bill. That did not scoop appropriations out of the Federal Treasury. That did not shovel them out. Uh, that provided that each individual would contribute one quarter of his earnings on his payroll and his employer one quarter of one percent. That half percent would be put in a fund. The government wouldn't spend anything. Now, the bill that was passed with the support of the Vice President and the President and the Secretary of Health and Education and Welfare will probably cost uh, the Federal Treasury and the State Treasuries in excess of a billion dollars, whereas our medical plan would not have cost them one thin dime. And uh, the plan that they propose will cost a billion dollars, but uh, will require a pauper's oath, and in my judgment, uh, a good many states won't adopt it, and it's uh, it's really going to be a disappointment to all the old folks, but it does call for appropriations of in excess of a billion dollars out of the federal and state treasury. Sen that's, that's, we would take that money and we'd use it for other purposes. Senator, the Republicans have put a price tag on the Democratic platform of something between 13 and 18 billion dollars. As you know, the Vice President did this himself the other day. In the light of that, uh, uh, how can you say that you expect the taxes to be reduced in the first four, in the first term of a Democratic I say president? that that could follow, and I would hope it would follow. Now, on the Vice President's uh, price tag, uh, he's not very specific about that. First, I would say it's phony. That's the first thing. Second, I'd say the Vice President knows very little about the Democratic platform, uh, or he wouldn't have made a statement like that. Third, I would point this out, that during this administration, the Agriculture Department has spent more money in seven years than they've spent in the entire 70 preceding. Uh, they're spending six or seven billion dollars a year now to run farmers off the farm. They've increased their employment by 40,000 people. Now, you can't tell me that Jack Kennedy is going to sit around the president very long without to, uh, cleaning out that situation. So we're going to affect the economy. Jack Kennedy likes to... Uh, be careful and prudent, and he is a cautious man, and he's not going to be a wild spender, and my judgment is that you, if you'll read the Democratic platform instead of the Republican uh, 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 propaganda sheets, you'll see that it pledges a balanced budget except in cases of a national emergency. Well, Senator, thank you very much indeed for coming here to face the nation. Thanks also to today's <coughs> news correspondents, Peter Lissagor of the Chicago Daily News, William S. White, nationally syndicated columnist. This is Stuart Novins. We invite you to join us next week at this same time for another edition of Face the Nation, when from San Francisco, our guest will be the Republican vice presidential candidate, Henry Cabot Lodge. Our program today originated in Washington. Face the Nation was produced by Michael J. Marlowe, associated in production, Ellen Wadley, directed by Bill Linden. Today you saw the Democratic vice presidential candidate, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas, Face the Nation. Hal Stepler speaking. This has been a public affairs presentation of CBS News. This is the CBS Television Network.